Discipline is the ability to delay gratification. Are you able to delay your own gratification in order to have a better result in the end? Let me talk to you about a wise fruit farmer. <laughs> Let's just say that somebody plants a grove of peach trees. And, you know, they just put this little stick in the ground. Well, it's going to take a long time for that thing to become a tree. And the farmer just keeps tending to it and watering it and protecting it when freezes come in and all these things. And so it's finally a peach tree and it's got all these leaves and it's looking healthy and he's waiting for fruit. Oh, here it comes. Little baby peaches. They're so cute. I'm sure that that's the way God feels about us sometimes. Oh, I started with you when you were just a stick. <laughs> and I planted you in the soil of my son's life. And you began to take root. And then finally you had some little branches. And I've been waiting so long for fruit. <laughs> and then, boop. Oops, there's a little bit of love. Oop, a little bit of joy. Oop, a little bit of peace. Oop. And I bet God's so excited. But you know what? He's a wise farmer too. And you know what the really wise peach farmer does? The first year when those little baby peaches appear, he goes and picks them all off. Before they have a chance to really ripen and grow any bigger he picks them all off why would he do that why do we sometimes think that God himself is blocking us from we want to have a ministry we want to have prosperity <laughs> I get so tick of the people tell me how I can write my book why, you silly thing, you haven't even ever finished a book in your whole life. Go back and read one through before you decide to write one. <laughs> How can I start my ministry? You better hope you don't start it. Because <laughs> that's the stuff we have problems with, the stuff we start, and God's not got nothing to do with it, and then we can't finish. Well, why does the farmer go pluck off all those little tiny cute peaches? They're cute. Cute. Baby Christians are cute. But they're no good for anything in the long run. <laughs> Hello? You know, the baby Christian is cute that says, God, I need a word. I mean, I used to get some of the most amazing things from God. I would tell Dave, and you know, Dave's not easy to impress. And I would tell him, I asked God this. I told him I needed to have an answer. Look what he gave me. And it would just be amazing. Cute. Exciting. But no good long term. Because it was all in the emotional realm. Well, then I started trying that, and I'd get stuff like, woe be unto you, you wicked sinner. <laughs> oh, oh. I mean, you know, I've tried that up to 25 and 30 times, couldn't get anything decent now. <laughs> I mean, you walk with God about 40 years and then try to get a word like that and see what you get. You know why? Because God wants to lead you by His Spirit. He doesn't want to lead you by outward signs and confirmations and prophecies and all these things that we have to have to prove to us that God's speaking to us and that He's around. Amen. I don't care if I feel God or not. He's here. He said He'd never leave me nor forsake me. I don't have to feel anointed. I know I am anointed. I don't have to feel like giving. I don't have to feel like loving. I don't have to feel like doing what's right. Because I'm rooted and grounded. I know where I'm headed, and I know that I'm going to make it because God is never going to leave me. 
And as long as you stay in that realm of, well, are we there yet? I just, God, if I don't get a breakthrough today, I just don't even know if I can stay saved. <laughs> Given God our list every morning of the 20 things we got to have that day in order to just stay in the program and act decent. <laughs> we need to have a transition. And we need to start going to God every morning and saying, God, you don't have to do anything for me to keep me happy. I'm just happy to know you. I'm just so grateful to know you. God, you already know the things I want. I've told you two million times. And I trust that when the time is right, if it's right, you'll do it. In the meantime, what do you have for me to do? Who can I help today? Who can I be a blessing to today? You know, we are still so selfish and self-centered. And even in our relationship with God, sometimes we just want to use God to get what we want. And then if we're not getting what we want, we got a bad attitude. Patience is not an ability to wait. You're going to wait whether you like it or not. But patience is how you act while you're waiting. Patience is the fruit of the Spirit that only develops and grows under trial. It can't grow any other place. Patience doesn't grow in good times. I used to have a series on patience. I still got them, but now I hide them under other titles. Because if I put a series out there on that table that said, learning to be patient, ain't nobody going to buy that. <laughs> you know why? Because you know when you start asking God to develop patience in you, what you're going to get is problems. Yeah. And man, we're going to do everything we can to circumvent that. <laughs> we don't want no part of that. And yet, if you read what patience means in the Greek, you can't get it any other way except from going through things and learning how to be the same when you're going through as you would be if you were getting everything you wanted right now. It's all right, you clap now. <laughs> Write me a letter later and say, it's two months later, Joyce, I'm still clapping at home. <laughs> That's when I want you to clap. Thank you. <laughs> Remember that next week when you feel like just throwing in the towel and giving up. I want you to stand in your floor and say, hey, Sister Joyce, I'm still clapping. The hasty and the impatient person always loses in the end. I heard something recently that I thought was really good. I was reading this book. It was about discipline and the author, who I can't even remember who it was right now, he said, we need to have the ability not only to plan our pleasure, but to plan our pain. Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> My gosh, the whole place just went like... Why, Joyce, would I want to plan any pain? <laughs> I've already got enough pain in my life. Well, and probably it's because you never planned the right kind of pain <laughs> to start with. What do I mean by that? I try to go to the gym and work out three times a week. When I am there suffering, I say, I cannot believe that I am paying for this. I plan that pain so I can have the pleasure of still getting into my daughter's clothes. <laughs> Whoo, hallelujah. I'm going to be somewhere Sunday and they have a dessert I just love. It's like my favorite dessert on the planet. And I'm planning to eat it. I've seen myself put it on the plate, put a little ice cream on it. It's like an event. Go sit down somewhere. But you know what I'm having first? I'm planning my pain. 
I won't eat bread at lunch today. I won't eat pasta for lunch today. I'm paying up front for those calories that I'm going to eat <laughs> Sunday night. If you'll learn to plan both your pain and your pleasure, then you can have balance in your life and end up with a life that you're really going to be proud of. But if you're only going to plan your pleasure, you're going to end up with nothing but pain and no pleasure. Hello. Our ministry has no debt, and we've never had any. You know why? Because Dave Meyer is patient. And he says, we'll buy it when we have the money. <laughs> so, we had very painful circumstances for a long time because we didn't have a building big enough, and we kept renting every little bit of space that was around us anywhere. We had stuff all over the place. One department was here, another one was across the parking lot over here, another one was here, another one was over there. We had desks crammed everywhere you could have desks. But when we moved into our building, we moved in with it paid for. And we had no pressure. We planned our pain so we could have our pleasure. We got to get over all the instant gratification. Got to have it now, got to have it now, 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 now. Got to have it now, got to have it now. I mean, I don't think Dave and I even took a vacation until after we'd been married 15 years. And <laughs> let alone a honeymoon. You know what our honeymoon was? Dave hung curtains while I nagged at him. <laughs> we didn't have anything. He borrowed $500 from his boss against a future paycheck in order for us to make a down payment on probably about $3,000 worth of furniture. And the stuff was so no good that when Dave jumped in the bed a little hard one night, the mattress fell through. <laughs> Another time, the couch fell through. Remember that? The couch broke. The bed broke. <laughs> we didn't have anything. I remember cashing in soda bottles to go buy my cigarettes back when I was in my <laughs> 20s. Had to have them smokes, man. Cash in everything you can find. Get those cigarettes. But can I tell you something? I wouldn't trade those years for nothing. And if you don't ever have years like that, I venture to say you'll never grow up. If everything's just handed to you on a silver platter and you have instant gratification, you never have to work for anything, you never have to wait for anything, you never have to go through anything, you may go to heaven, but you know what? You'll never be a very fruit-bearing Christian while you're here. Well, you can clap or not clap, but it's true. You know, the prodigal son that we talk about out of Luke 15, you might remember him. A young man had one older brother, a very rich father. And the young boy wanted his inheritance early. He wanted it now. He didn't want to wait. He said, Father, I want you to divide unto me the part of the inheritance that belongs to me. And the Bible says he took that money and he went. And, and the Amplified Bible says he lived in loose from restraint living. In other words, he basically was saying, I want to get out of here and go do my own thing. Now, you know, that's an 18-year-old thinks that's the thing to do. I'm going to get out of here and do my own thing. And, and the thing that was interesting to me was the father let him go. He didn't argue with him about it, didn't try to get him to change his mind. He just let him go. Because sometimes the best lessons you learn are the hard way. So he went out and he wasted everything he had on loose from restraint living. And ended up working for a pig farmer, eating the same thing the pigs ate. We can do things our way, but we'll end up in the pig pen. Hello? And so he woke up. The Bible says he came to himself and he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to my father. Well, the father met him with open arms. Blessed him. Great meal. Nice robe. New sandals, because I'm sure he was a dirty, filthy mess. But you know, there's something that we don't mention a lot. 
I do want to remind you that even though his father received him back and loved him and was merciful to him, he had spent his inheritance. And you know, there's any mistake we make, we can be forgiven for it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't waste things and lose out on things that we could have had with a lot of joy if we would have just been a little more patient and willing to go through just a little bit more. You know, everybody, it's very popular today to talk about the grace of God. And oh, thank God for His grace. You know, grace is not an excuse to live a sloppy life and get by with it. Yes, because of the grace of God, we can be forgiven. Because of the grace of God, we can go to heaven. But God still wants us to live holy lives. He still wants us to discipline ourselves. He still wants us to be consecrated. He still wants us to be givers and get over being selfish and self-centered. And He wants us to be patient because the Bible says that it's only by faith and patience that we inherit the promises of God. Now you can become an inheritor or you can be a laborer. I personally like the inheriting thing better. I know one thing, my kids have got it a whole lot better than I had it. It's wonderful to just inherit. We're joint heirs with Christ. But when you become a laborer, boy, everything gets really tough. And we're going to talk in just a minute about how we can tell when we're in the flesh or in the spirit, when it's our plan or God's plan. But first, let me just say this, because I think this is an important part of this message. Another area where the Bible encourages us not to be impatient and hasty is in making judgments. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. So do not make any hasty or premature judgments. Now, I believe many relationships that had a great possibility have been totally ruined due to hasty judgments. We look at somebody, we size them up on the outside, and we don't know anything about them at all. I don't know what would have happened to me if Dave wouldn't have seen beyond the hard shell that I had around me from being hurt. Everybody's got a story. And if you take time to hear somebody's story, all of a sudden you might understand why they're behaving the way they're behaving. And then you'll be able to stick with them long enough for God to be able to use you as a good example of them and give them a desire to change. And that's exactly what happened to me with Dave. When Dave was praying for a wife, he asked God to give him somebody that needed help. And let me tell you, he really got his prayer answered. <laughs> I don't recommend praying like that unless you're ready. Because I'm quite sure when he prayed that prayer, he didn't think he's going to get me. We definitely had a divine relationship. I was outside washing my mother's car. Dave drove up to pick up a guy that he worked with. He saw me. Said, would you like to wash my car when you're done? I said, if you want your car washed, wash it yourself. <laughs> the first date we had, we went bowling. He said, would you like something to drink? I said, yeah, I'll take a beer. He said, would you like a glass? I said, nope, the bottle will be just fine. <laughs> we had five dates and he asked me to marry him. And he said he only waited till the fifth date because he didn't want to scare me. He said, I knew the night that I met you that you were the woman I was going to marry. Now, he either had to be crazy or being led by God, one of the two. <laughs> but here we are, 44 years later, and hopefully the pain he went through is worth it to him now. <laughs> See, too many people give up on relationships today. I mean, if the other person's not making you happy, Yeah, we're not compatible. <laughs> Nobody's compatible. <laughs> there are no two people that I think are really compatible. You got to learn how to appreciate your differences 
And you learn how to let God make the two one. You learn you're not right about everything and the other person's not wrong about everything. You learn that you don't have to have your way all the time. You learn to get yourself off your mind and live to make somebody else happy rather than expecting them to live to make you happy. Come on, I'm preaching good. And so we just give up. You should never go into a relationship thinking, now you're going to make me happy. <laughs> you should go into that relationship thinking, I'm going to live every day of my life to make you happy. And then when you do that, you know what will happen? You'll get so happy you won't hardly know what to do with yourself. You know why? Because you won't have your mind on yourself. You can't be happy and self-centered. It don't work. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Well, what about me? What about me? What about me? <laughs> I'm tired of waiting. I don't want to wait. I want it now, right now, 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 now. Well, Dave had to wait a long time. I mean, we were married three years before I even remotely acted like a human being. <laughs> I mean, I'd get mad at Dave and wouldn't say one word to him for three weeks. Because I'll, all I knew anything about was manipulation and control. I watched my dad control everybody with anger, so I tried to do the same thing. And yes, I was a Christian. But I was carnal. I was walking in the flesh. God was living in my spirit, but I didn't know how to listen. And so I was miserable all the time. And I was always trying to make God bless my plans. You know, you don't plan and then pray that God will make your plan work. <laughs> you pray and you find out what God's plan is. And then it will always work. How can you tell when you're in works of the flesh? Well, number one, you're frustrated all the time. Always frustrated. You struggle. You labor. You're weary. You feel burdened. My gosh, it was hard work trying to change Dave. <laughs> oh. I mean, I remember how frustrating it was. Because it just never worked. And I didn't understand, and I would say, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And the problem was he didn't want me to do anything. He wanted me to trust him that he would do something. You cannot talk somebody into changing. <laughs> because the change has to come from the inside out. And most of the time, they're not the ones that need to change anyway. It's us. We just don't know it. Don't look like you're disconnecting. I'm not done yet. <laughs> you know what I pray for in my life now on a regular basis? And I believe this is godly. I pray for a holy ease. Now, I'm not expecting everything in my life to be easy. But I believe even in hard things, you can have what I call a holy ease. That means that God is just all over it. It's well oiled. Everything's falling into place. There's a flow. It may be hard, but it's good. This is working because I'm not trying to do it by myself. What did Jesus say? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will ease, relieve, and refresh your souls. Yes, there's a holy ease that we can live by. And I'll tell you what it is. It's grace. Grace is God's power coming to us freely, enabling us to do with ease what we could never do on our own with any amount of struggle and effort. Grace is not the ability to live a sloppy life and get by with it. Grace is the power not to have to sin. Grace is the power to say no to yourself. Grace is the power from God to delay gratification. Grace is the power from God to plan your pain so you know then that you can have the pleasure that you want to have. Grace is the power to wait with a good attitude. Grace is the power to keep doing what's right for a long time, even if you don't get a right result when you wanted to get one. Grace is having God all over it. Grace is having God all over a marriage that's a little bit tough to stick with. 
Grace is having God all over that kid that's hard to manage. And you hearing from God about how to handle each situation that comes along. Grace doesn't just save us. Grace lets us live with some sanity. Grace lets us live with power. Grace lets us live with a holy ease. No matter how hard things are, we can say, I'm in the flow. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm in the flow. I tell you more than anything, I want people to have what Jesus died for us to have. 